morning, church. The uh, scripture reading for the sermon this morning will be from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The pew up here where I'm sitting is a little bit empty. Emma woke up feeling bad, and so Leslie stayed home with her. And so I'm missing my family up here, but I'm with the family of the Lord with you. Good to be with you here this morning. Thank you for reading our scripture reading there, Braden, from 1 Peter chapter 2. Last week, we began a series of lessons on the priesthood. We talked about the Jewish priesthood, and I promised you last week, Lord willing, that we would look at the non-Jewish priesthood. And there might be... A name or two on that list of priests that you're not quite so familiar with. Perhaps you know who Melchizedek is. Jethro, and we're not talking about the Beverly Hillbillies, not my son. And then Balaam. What is the significance? There are several priests that are mentioned there within the Old Testament that have nothing to do with the Jewish people or the law of Moses. And those are who we're going to be talking about today because that passage that was read for us there says that we are a priesthood, so it helps us to know what God expected of those priests who were of old, so that we know what our duties are for us today. I do have another outline that I have placed within the bulletin that you can follow along if you would like to, and what we're going to try to discover, as you can see within that introduction, is what is the significance of those individuals, those priests that have nothing to do with the Jewish heritage within the scriptures, why are they listed there and what lessons can we learn from them? And we're going to learn some positive lessons from those who were good priests of God. And then we're going to learn some negative lessons from those who did not do what God wanted them to do. These priests, though, uh, one of them finds his priesthood prior to the law of Moses. The other two actually come about during or just prior to the law of Moses. But just briefly, under point number one... Turn with me to Genesis chapter 14. I got a little bit behind on my PowerPoint, but Genesis chapter 14, there is a man that mysteriously appears on the scene. Abram has gone to rescue his nephew, Lot. Uh, Chedilomar had a confederacy of five kings that he came, and what they had done was destroy or conquer Sodom and Gomorrah, basically, and took Lot, Abram's nephew, with him. And so Abram has gone to rescue Lot. He has allies of his own that you can find listed there in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 13. And with 318 men, he goes and he conquers Chedilomar and his folks, and he brings back his nephew. And as he is returning, he is met by two kings that are vastly different. One is the king of Salem. The other one is the king of Sodom and Gomorrah. One is a righteous king, and the other one is a wicked man. And Abraham, in no uncertain terms, lets these kings know where they stand in his estimation of things. This is Genesis chapter 14. Let's begin in verse 17. And then after his return from the defeat of Chedilomar and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shebev, that is, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and he said, Blessed be Abraham of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has handed over your enemies to you. And he gave him a tenth of everything. And then the king of Sodom said to Abraham, Give the people to me and take the possessions for yourself. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, so that you do not say that I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing except what the young men have eaten and the share of my men who are with me, Anner, Eshcol, and Mamre, let them take their share. And those are the three brothers who were the allies of Abram as he went and conquered uh, Chedilomar and his folks. 
So what did we hear about Melchizedek? Well, he is a king, the king of Salem, which later on is going to become Jerusalem. And so he is the king of what later will be Jerusalem, but he is also identified in verse 18 as being a priest. That is very mysterious. And we're going to get into this more next week as we have our lesson in comparison between Melchizedek and Christ, and we're going to look at that because the Hebrew writer compares those two. What are the significance of that comparison? But we also have a, another record of Melchizedek's name within the scriptures. Turn with me to Psalm 110. As you see there within your outline, verse 4, it says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever within the order of Melchizedek. And we'll discuss what that means. Like I said, a little bit more next week, Lord willing, a priest forever like or after the order of Melchizedek. So that's the first priest that we encounter. The second priest that we encounter is Jethro or rule. Turn with me to Exodus chapter two, beginning in verse 15. If you remember how Pharaoh's daughter had raised uh, Moses within his palace and then Moses, whenever he caught a guard mistreating his brother, an Israelite, he killed him. And then Pharaoh wanted to kill him. And so Moses was on the run. And while he was fleeing from Egypt, he runs into a family. And listen here, this is beginning in verse 15, Exodus chapter 2. And when Moses, or Moses, when Pharaoh heard about this matter, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and he settled in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters. And they came to draw water and filled their troughs to, uh, to water their father's flock. And then the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and he helped them and watered their flock. When they had come to their father rule, they says, well, he said, why do you come back so soon today? And they said, an Egyptian saved us from the shepherds. Uh, that's interesting because that means Moses must have still looked like an uh, Egyptian out of Pharaoh's court. Although he is a Hebrew, he must have had that appearance because Jethro's daughters say, an Egyptian it is that has saved us. He even drew water for us and he watered our flock. And so he said to his daughter, well, where is he then? Why is it that you have left the man behind? Invite him to have something to eat. And Moses was willing to live with the man. And he gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses. And then she gave birth to a son. And he named him Gershom. For he says, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. That uh, word in Hebrew uh, is ger, means a stranger or a foreigner. And so he calls his son name Gershon. And then in chapter 18, Moses is leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. And we have Jethro coming for a visit again. This is in verse 1. Now Jethro, what is he indicated as? He's called a priest of Midian. Moses' father-in-law heard about everything that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people. And how the Lord had brought the Israel out of Egypt. Egypt. And so Jethro goes for a visit, but once again, he is designated as being a priest of the Most High God. Melchizedek, a priest having nothing to do with the Jewish blood or the Jewish lineage. Jethro, and in fact, Abraham pays Melchizedek a tithe. We'll get into that later on too. Jethro, seemingly all of the things that are taking place with Israel and his people are way over in the west in the land of Egypt. And here is this man over in the east in this forbidden country where very few people live. And yet he is designated as being a priest of God most high. And then one more, and this is maybe the one out of the three that you are most familiar with. Go with me to Numbers chapter 22. And it's a priest by the name of Balaam, Numbers chapter 22. And we find within this incident, and we're going to get more into detail with this as we go, but there is a king, Balak, that is trying to patronize the priest or the prophet, Balaam. And they have very similar names. Just to change that last consonant on, on the name, the prophet is Balaam, the, the, the king is Balak. And so Balak is trying to get Balaam into his service. Why? Well, because what we have recorded for us within this national account in Numbers chapter 22 and verse 9 is that Balaam has a connection with God. Then God came to Balaam and he said, who are these men that are with you? And we find in this account that Balaam is called a prophet or a priest of God. Let's begin in verse 1 of Numbers chapter 22. 
Then the sons of Israel journeyed on, and they camped in the plains of Moab, beyond the Jordan, opposite of Jericho. Now Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all Israel had done to the Amorites, and so Moab was in great fear because of the people, for they were numerous. And Moab was in dread of the sons of Israel. Moab said to the elders of Midian, Now this horde will eat up all that surrounds us as the ox eats up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was a king of Moab at that time. And so he sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor, at Pethor, which is near the Euphrates River in the land of the sons of his people, to call for him, saying, Behold, a people have come out of Egypt, and behold, they are covering the surface of the land, and they are living opposite of me. Now, therefore, please come, curse this people for me, since they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I will be able to defeat them and to drive them out of the land, for I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. What is unique about Balaam? He has a connection to God, and even the heathens know it and are trying to employ him. Three men, not of Jewish descent, Melchizedek, Jethro, and Balaam. What in the world is going on? You know, usually we think of uh, the priesthood as being within the Old Testament and those things that are detailed for them to do within the law of Moses. And for the most part, that is the case. And we discussed that in full uh, last week, uh, that they were the connection between the people and God. They pled the, the, the case of the people. They received those teachings from God. And in fact, we saw that they had other obligations as well, that they were dietitians determining what the people could and could not eat, what was clean and unclean, that they were medical examiners. If you had an issue of blood, or you had some sort of a disease, they certainly were those who stood before the altar and they offered sacrifices to atone for the sins of the people, but they were also the teachers of the law. And we tried to compare that, if you remember, to a town that is just being settled and that you have to have a school or a church, you have to have a general store, you have to have a place where the sheriff resides, that you have to have a hospital. And what do we see? The priest under the law of Moses, under what God had declared to them at Mount Sinai, what do we see them doing? They are a part of, they are infiltrating, uh, they are controlling, you know, almost every facet of the children of Israel. If they needed leadership, to where should they turn? They should have turned to the Levites. And that's why I believe that God was so upset with them whenever they wanted a king. Whenever they wanted to go from a theocracy to a monarchy, whenever they wanted to cease to follow the way God had directed them and to begin to follow a man, what God had set up within the priesthood wasn't simply like a ceremonial or ritual. It wasn't just men standing before the altar with blood upon their garments, although that was part of it, but God had established a leadership that was within the children of Israel, within those Levites. And we saw that as God narrowed down out of all of the tribes of Israel, that he narrowed it down to that one tribe, to the tribe of Levi. And then from that one tribe, he narrows it down to one man. One man had access to him. And God was saying, these men are what connect the sinner to me. And so where in the world do Melchizedek, Jethro, and Balaam come into play? What is going on here? Well, let's go back, okay? And let's look at some of these characteristics of these men. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 14 there. And let's see what it says that Melchizedek holds up as being precious. What is it that he espouses? Whenever he comes to uh, Abraham after he is returning from the battle, what kinds of things does he bring with him? Bread and wine. I, what did we just celebrate? The Lord's Supper with what? With bread and the fruit of the vine. Wine, which is Christ's body and, and Christ's blood. I don't think that this symbolism is coincidental at all. And I, we're going to be talking about this more in full next week as we compare Melchizedek and Christ. But it is rather mysterious that Melchizedek would choose to bring these two particular items to sustain Abraham after his battle and to really kind of honor him for his victory. But what does he say? What does Melchizedek say about Abraham and about God? What kind of God does Melchizedek represent? And he blessed him and he said, blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. Who is he a priest of? Now this may surprise you, but not really if you think about it, but there can be priests who are 
not godly, that are evil. And if you want to go to your outline, uh, number three there, it has listed several that held the title of priest. There was a priest in Genesis chapter 41, a priest of On, an uh, Egyptian god, and that was actually Joseph's father-in-law. We see the priest of Baal over and over again throughout the, the scriptures, that great showdown on Mount Carmel with Elijah, and then another one that is listed there with Jehoiada. And then even in the New Testament, we have uh, Paul on his missionary journey running into a priest of Jupiter. What does that tell us? Well, there are all kinds of priests. There are idolatrous priests. What kind of priest is Melchizedek? Well, he blesses in the name of who? In the name of God Most High, in the name of the God of Abraham. And he also says to Abraham, this God is the God that has created the heavens and the earth. Well, he's talking about Jehovah, isn't he? He's talking about Elohim, and he says to Abraham, this God has blessed you because you have defeated your enemies and because you have been victorious over them. How do we know that Abraham honors Melchizedek? Well, he doesn't honor the king of Sodom, does he? He goes, I'm not even going to take a shoelace off of your shoe, buddy. Why? Because, he says, I don't want anyone to think that you made me rich. I don't, want it, I don't want you to think if you give me something that I only have it and I'm blessed because you gave me those possessions. He said, I'm not going to take anything from you. Why? Well, what did the king of Sodom and Gomorrah represent but a evil city, a city that in just a short amount of time that God was going to destroy with hellfire and brimstone? And so what is Abraham recognizing? That all men in positions of power do not deserve homage, but he gives a tithe unto Melchizedek. And the Hebrew writer tells us the significance of that. And we'll get into that, like I say, next week. But what about Jethro? Who does he prophesy for? Go back to Exodus chapter 18. And whenever he comes to Moses and he begins to talk about those things that are going on, listen now to how Jethro talks about these things and for whom is he a priest for? This is beginning first off in verse 1. Now Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard about everything that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Skip down to verse 10 if you're following along in your Bibles. So Jethro said, blessed be the Lord, that is Jehovah or Yahweh there, who rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of Pharaoh and who rescued the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods. Indeed, it was proven whenever he acted uh, insolently against the people. Then Jethro... Moses' father-in-law took a burnt offering and sacrifices for God. And Aaron came with all of the elders of Israel to eat a meal with Moses' father-in-law before God. Still a mystery, but we, we know who he serves. We know who Melchizedek serves. What is God doing? Well, we know within this particular age that God spoke to his people. How? Through the heads of the family. Through the, through the patriarchs. We see him doing that with Adam. We see him doing that with Enoch. We see him doing that with Noah. That God is speaking to the heads of the household in such a way that they understand what his will is for them. How do we know that he spoke to Adam? Because Abel offered a sacrifice by faith and Cain did not. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Abel and Cain both had been taught to offer sacrifices properly. One obeyed and one didn't. One pleased God and the other one didn't. God speaking through the heads of the household at that time. How, did, how do we know that God had spoke to Noah? Well, how else did he know how to build that ark with the, without the instructions that God would give him? And what did he become as a follower but a faithful follower who was declared to be a preacher of righteousness and a teacher of his will what did Melchizedek then represent in Salem but a man to whom God spoke we don't have really any other connection between Melchizedek and Abraham except for this one here but we know that there is a connection because Abraham gives a tithe of everything to Melchizedek and then Melchizedek blesses Abram in such a way as you would think a man of God would be able to bless somebody that is underneath him some way somehow we're not exactly told how but some way somehow God is speaking through Melchizedek, declaring his will during that time of Abraham and Abraham recognizing him as being a man of God. What about Jethro? 
When, in the wilderness, whenever everything seems to be going on over there in the west, right, in, in Egypt, we have this man over here within this area in Midian, in the wilderness, who is called a priest of God. What kind of priest was he? He was a priest of God most high. He knows how to offer sacrifices. How does he know how to do that? If he knows how to offer sacrifices some way, somehow, God has instructed him on how to do that. God is teaching them. And so through the course of the way of God's way of doing things, God brings Moses out of Egypt in connection with this prophet of Midian, Jethro, and sustains Moses for that 40-year period whenever he was on the run away from his home, uh, on the run from Egypt, so that he can be prepared to go back and for the next 40 years become the leader of the children of Israel. Does Jethro play an important part within Moses' life? He gives his daughter, Zipporah, to be his wife. Would that have been a kosher thing to do? He was marrying outside of the children of Israel. Okay, well, that's, the law is not yet given at that point. But what I think God is doing is even with the giver of the law, that he is emphasizing this concept that priests are holy, that priests are pure, that priests have authority only so long as they do my bidding. Simply to have the title of a priest gives you no spiritual power whatsoever unless that power is then connected to God. And we're going to see that within the next example with Balaam, okay? Balaam, turn, if you'd like to, to the book of Numbers again in chapter 22. Balaam is a man that is recognized by others as having power from God, so much so that the king of Moab is thinking that if he can get Balaam to curse the children of Israel, then they are just going to wither up and blow away. He has seen what they have done, as we read in that account. The king of Moab, as they have marched into the land, it says that in that one place that they were camped that they were numberless, and Balak is deathly afraid. Uh, and if, uh, he goes to Balaam, he sends messengers to him, and he says, we need you to come and to curse this people because we know that those you curse are cursed and then that way I will be blessed. Balaam lives way up to the north. If you remember whenever Abraham came out of Ur of the Chaldees, he stopped off in Haran, which is up there north. That's where Kirkamesh is. That's, that's very close to where Balaam lives. Now, I point that out because they have gone a great distance to get a hold of uh, of Balaam. They are down here in the south. If you look at that rectangle down there, that's Moab or, or, or Amnon. That is where they have traveled from in order to get up there because they have heard of this man's power. They know that he has connection to the Most High God. And so Balak says, send elders, tell him we'll, we're going to reward him. Just tell him to come and to curse. This is Numbers chapter 22. Look at verse 7 with me. And so the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian left with the fees of divination in their hands. And they came to Balak, and they repeated Balak's words to him. And so they've come. They have all of the treasures with them. They say, this is what Balak, the king of Moab, wants you to do for him. And Balaam says, okay, hold on. Let me go and check with the head office first. That's a good thing, right? And he said to them, spend the night here, and I will bring word back to you just as the Lord may speak to me. And the leaders of Moab stayed with Balaam. So we have there a direct connection with God in this next verse. Then God came to Balaam and he said, who are these men with you? And Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab, sent word to me. And behold, there is a people who has come out of Egypt and they covered the surface of the land. Now come and curse them for me. Perhaps I will be able to fight against them and to drive, drive them out. And so verse what, what has Balaam done? He has gone. He has asked God. He says, this is what the king of Moab wants me to do. And God says to Balaam, do not go with him. You shall not curse this people, for they are blessed. And so Balaam got up the next morning, and he said to Balak's representatives, go back to your land, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. And the representatives from Moab got up, and they went to Balak, and they said, Balaam has refused to come. Now, who is Balaam? He is a priest of God, right? What does that mean? Well, he has connection with God so long as he continues to do what God desires of him. That's the only way that he has holiness or purity or any type of authority. And that should have been the end of the story right there, right? 
that portion that we just read, God says no, but it doesn't stop there. They go back, they tell to Balak, well, he said that he's not coming, and Balak says, you have got to get him to come. Promise him more money. Go get people with greater authority. Go back, bring Balaam back, and don't come back without him. And evidently they had carried with them enough treasure or enough promise that it turns Balaam's neck because what has God already said? No. 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 Now, whenever I was growing up, if my mom told me no, and then I just went and I asked my dad, did that, this rule ever happen in your house? I still didn't have permission because if my mom said no and my dad said yes, and I went ahead and did it anyways. What had I just done? My parents always said, one no is sufficient. What Balaam has done now, as he has received answer from God, is that he is going to go back and he is going to ask again. And then Balak sent representatives once again, more numerous, more distinguished than previous. And they came to Balaam and they said to him, this is what Balak, the son of Zippor, says. I beg you, let nothing keep you from coming to me. For I will indeed honor you richly and I will do whatever you tell me. Please come and to curse these people. But Balaam replied to the servants of Balak, Even if Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could do nothing, either small or great, contrary to the command of God. And that sounds good, doesn't it? He should have left it right there. But he continues on. Now please, so that you may stay here tonight, and I will find out what else the Lord says to me. What's he doing? He has already gotten to know. He is a priest of God. He has direct connection with God. Is God wishy-washy? Does God say one thing, but he intends another? But now God says something here to Balaam that I think is very sarcastic because at first it almost sounds as though he changed his mind and God came to Balaam at night and he said to him, if the men have come to call you, rise up and go with them, but you shall do only the thing that I tell you to do. And you say, well, that doesn't quite sound like he said it sarcastically, except for what follows. As Balaam is going on on his journey, returning with these men from way up north, going back down to the land of Moab, he is riding on a donkey. And as he rides along, this donkey starts to veer off the path because the donkey sees something within the way that Balaam doesn't see. What does the donkey see? The donkey sees an angel with its sword drawn standing in the way. And so at first, the donkey just tries to get off the path and to go. And Balaam starts to beat that donkey, get him back up on the path. And then they come into another spot where it was so narrow, the ravine, there was a wall on either side. And the donkey trying to avoid the angel just narrowly misses, but he crushes Balaam's foot against the side of the wall. And oh, Balaam is hot, and he starts beating that donkey again. And then finally, they come to a spot that is so narrow that the angel standing with its sword drawn would not allow the donkey to pass, and the donkey just sat down. Now, what does all of this communicate? The donkey sees it. Balaam doesn't. What does that communicate about God? What does that mean when, about when God says, yeah, you just go ahead and go with them and, and, and return to them to the land of, of Moab? Uh, it's kind of like your parents that they said they gave you permission, but it was only because you were badgering them. They had already told you no, but you kept on and you kept on. And they finally said, all right, well, go ahead and go. And you knew that you were going, but you weren't going with your, your parents' blessing. God is telling Balaam no longer, you know, directly through voice, but he is telling him in the form of his donkey how stupid can you be? That is what he is trying to get across to him. And finally, that place that is so narrow, the donkey just sits down. He, he doesn't even go anywhere. He just sits down in that spot because of that angel with the sword drawn. And Balaam begins to beat that donkey again. And then the Lord opens up the mouth of that donkey in the eyes of Balaam. And the donkey says, why are you beating me? <laughs> Have I not been a good donkey to you? And I tell you what, Balaam, just like Wilbur and Mr. Ed, just started talking right back to that donkey. I think I'd been off of the donkey and moving down the path by that time. But he says, no, no, you've been a good donkey to me. You've never been a bad donkey, but you're sure being naughty today. And the donkey says it's because of that angel that's standing there within the path. And what Balaam realizes is that three times his stupid donkey has delivered his life. What was God trying to say to Balaam? You're not on the right path. 
you're not heading the right direction. And even though God had said to Balaam, you just go on and go there, it wasn't because God wanted him to. It was because Balaam's heart had been given over to greed. What makes a priest a priest? What makes him holy? What makes him pure? What gives him authority only so long as he follows God's directives? What is Balaam doing? He is ceasing to be a spokesperson or a priest for God. And in the process of what follows, Balaam's not able to curse the children of Israel every time that he attempts to do so. Three times he, he attempts to curse the children of Israel, and every time God puts a blessing in his mouth instead, much to the uh, chagrin of Balak. And then finally, Balaam says, okay, I tell you what, this is how you get to them. And then Balaam caused the Israelites to be unfaithful by teaching unto Balak that if you will just get them to break connection with God, if you will just get them to be as wicked and as evil as you, if you can just get them involved, and he taught them the ways of sexual impurity in order that he might gain whatever it was, whatever treasure or renown that Balak was offering unto him, and he becomes the epitome of a false teacher within the New Testament. And you can see that there in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 15, also in Jude verse 11, and in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 14. What happened? Well, unlike Melchizedek, unlike Jethro, Balaam severed his connection with God. He stopped serving him. And so what do we learn by looking at these non-Jewish priests, that those who would be priests, remember Peter tells us that we are a royal priesthood. Those that would be priests must do what? They must listen to God most high. They must obey his commandments, his yeses and his noes, and they must walk holy within his way. I've got my conclusion just written out here that it is on your outline. Indeed, efficacious priesthood can exist only when it is established by the Lord. For according to the scripture, only God and his official representative can accomplish the atonement by which satisfaction is made for sin. Therefore, what makes a priest holy is not his bloodline, status, wealth, or influence, but it is his allegiance to God. There are false priests. There are evil priests. You can look those up on your own and to read the description of those. And so whenever Peter says that you are a people of God, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, we find in that not simply a compliment from an apostle, but a responsibility. One that says you have an obligation then, if you are a holy priesthood, to do those things that God desires you to do, namely following his son and his authority and his will. We are so blessed to have Jesus as our high priest. We are so blessed that it was his sacrifice upon that altar of the cross that it, we have forgiveness of sins. And as our high priest, he entered once and for all into the holiest of holies behind the veil, not with the blood of bulls and of rams, but with his own blood. And we celebrate that the resurrection of the dead, for the forgiveness of our sins. That's why we have the Lord's Supper. An effective sacrifice is all that, or an effective priest, excuse me, never challenging the authority of his father, Christ, doing what his father desired of him even though it cost him his life. Next week we're going to look at the Melchizedek and Christ correlation and then finally the the first week of March, we're going to look at our own priesthood in Christ. If you have not yet become a part of that priesthood, that holy nation, Christ calls you out of the world and into, won't you come as we stand and as we sing?